centuries past Since we first began our journey Across the sea to find the glory in the dream Just a tailor and a joiner and a brother Built our team Greeted sometimes with hostility But more often with the light The boys who rise and had to clear through troubled skies After constant days of struggle They arrived in paradise This feels like heaven This must be the dream This feels like paradise The best we've ever seen The best we've ever seen Even through the lean years Our support would flock in thousands Countless trophies stand displayed for all to view Side by side, brothers, sisters, we united And our children do the same November 1887 by a number of Catholics in the east end of the city. The main objective of the club is to supply the East End Conferences of the St Vincent de Paul Society to support those in the missions of St Mary's, Sacred Heart and St Michael's. Many cases of sheer poverty are left unaided through lack of means. A football club will be formed for the maintenance of the dinner tables of our needy children. This feels like heaven This must be a dream This feels like paradise The best we've ever seen The best we've ever seen We stand in paradise Brothers, sisters, hand in hand We stand in paradise So what's the fight? Good afternoon, welcome to a Celtic State of Mind in this Tuesday afternoon. This is your new look lineup. It's myself, Dick McConville, joined by Lawrence as always on a Tuesday. And Liam, eventually we've managed to get the permanent deal done. We know we've had a few loan deals, but you're <laughs> in the door. You're going to be joining us each Tuesday and you are very welcome. Um, gentlemen, the, the football's returned. I want to get right back into it. I'm storing this Argentina t-shirt after the weekend. Um, there's obviously a connection there. With Josip Juranovic at this point in time, he obviously faced Argentina in the semi-final of the World Cup. And, of course, the Spanish interest in him. Argentinians speak Spanish. So we'll be talking about Josip Juranovic. I want to obviously talk about the weekend. There's a bit of chat about Bolson Label in the press today, too. Um, and we'll also look towards tomorrow night's game against Livingston. Um, just if you haven't seen it already, our next Axon Live event has just been announced there. And um, we've already sold out Chalky and Tom Boyd and our next event is the one and only Danny McGrain who we were talking about last week Lawrence, we were talking about this book behind us um, How's it going Saturday Danny in good form as always? Yeah, great form that Danny was in you know uh, plenty of people popped along to the penalty spot got the pictures taken with him, a bit of chat with him about you know his favourite games and stuff uh, and then I mean Kevin popped round to the wee mans to, to catch the game and a big shout out to Danny Keegan in there, who assures me he's Kevin Keegan's brother. Not too sure if he is, but, you know, eh, another good Celtic pub in the Gallagate. So, and, you know, they kept his waiting, but, jeez. Sometimes those late goals are just just better, aren't they? Yeah, they, they are just better. Um, it was the too great for my feet, which were numb by the end of the game, but they get a wee bit of heat towards the end of the game. And Liam, I know you're maybe a bit too far away to, to be popping down to Sword Street, but I'm sure if you were in 
the, the vicinity, you, you wouldn't pass up the opportunity to, to see uh, and meet Danny McGrain? Well, only for another couple of days, because exactly 48 hours from now, my flight will be taking off from Narita, taking me and my good lady home for Christmas. So, uh, next time we do this show, we'll all be in the same time zone. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and of course, you, you know that, that Lawrence was only telling us that they're about a pub to try and get some more free drink off the, the guy in there. So, listen, God loves a trier, I'd be the exact same, mate. Um <laughs> Let's go. I, I want to ask you both first. I know uh, Liam, you were on the charity weekend, um, but but Cindy, what, what a game of football! Just very quickly, I know we'll try and get it out of the way first, but I'll come to you, Lawrence. And um, what a game of football! Very, very special to watch. Yeah, I see Goodwin's been taking a bit of stick for his tactics, but I suppose that's a dilemma managers face open up and get slaughtered, or you no know, part of the bus and try and hit in the break or for set pieces, you know. And, but for Callum strike, he would have been getting healed in the press for it, wouldn't he? You know, because it, you know, it ended up as much possession as we had. That you know, it was a narrow one. We missed some chances. Uh, the referee was given some strange free kick decisions at the edge of our box. But yeah, just brilliant to see Celtic back three points back, gaps back to nine points, and you know, the handball just keeps delivering. It does. Of course, I was talking about the World Cup final there, mate, but you're right. I, I would have said that that was a more special uh, three points. I get a lot more excited when uh, Callum's goal hit the back of it rather than the winning Argentinian penalty, but I was still I was still happy to see that. And Liam, very funny, I saw a, t- a tweet last night, and it, it's two years to decent Celtic and won the quadruple treble, and uh, mm. uh, Neil, Neil Lennon actually was the first manager to do that, go 2-0 up in the final, Team pulls it back to two each. You then go three two up next to time. It then goes three each, and you win it in penalties. So Celtic did it first. Um, so right. Argentina don't really have that claim to fame, but you know it's an achievement that I just don't think we we, we talk enough about just because of what happened that season and the circumstances around it. And you know when you look back and reflect, Celtic won every single trophy in four seasons, twelve trophies in a row, which is absolutely incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't think it will be beaten. Any time soon, uh, unless Celtic do five, <laughs> you know, um, which uh, which you know isn't impossible. But uh, uh, no, I really think that is um, it's it's a shame the way it ended. But that was the you know obviously winning nine championships in a row is one thing, but to win every every domestic tournament you enter for four years straight is is unparalleled. Um, you know, even the uh, even like the great the great Barcelona team of the of the late two uh, thousands uh, early twenty tens, the uh, the Milan team of the late eighties early nineties, even they got knocked out a cup now and again, you know. <laughs> yeah, it just takes one bad off to you. I mean, you, you saw that in the game against St Mirren. I know Celtic have went you know forty eight games and lost one, but it just shows you it just does take one bad off to you. So to keep that level of consistency, as you talk about cup competition, there, um, it can happen at any time. So. A phenomenal achievement, um, which I, I think I'd agree with you, will never be matched. And it, and it was strange, Lawrence, J.P. Taylor put up a video of it um, today in the stands. And it's just weird to look back in that now because we've been back to the football, which just became the norm again. But to think that we were sitting you know, in our houses watching you know, history being made, um, a, a real shame that we didn't get to experience it in person. But all the same, you know, very, very special for Celtic to have. Completed that. Yeah, I, mean, you know, I covered the game in the studio. I, I think part of it's when the cup final was, you know, it was during another season. You know, cup final was normally, the, you know, the pinnacle of the season, isn't it? But that's the, the, the ending point. And I think part of it is it just rolled on in the next season, you know. But yeah, it's just normal well, 12 trophies in a row. It's, it is going to take, take some doing, you know. If it's Celtic or anyone else, it even comes close to it, you know. It, They'll be talked about uh, forever. So it, it, it's strange how little credit they get, you know. Well, maybe that'll change over time. Be a bit of perspective. Yeah. Maybe it will change over time. Um, the big football debate, obviously, this week, and it's going to rumble on for a long time. It's going to be for both of you. I want to ask both of you guys who is who do you think is the best football player of all time and the best player that you've watched? Yeah. Lawrence, That's I know you're going to see a Celtic debate. player. That was a definite penalty for Hibs. <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> Jesus, get it real. You know what I mean? Well, it's right. all, mate. Oh. well, 
More oh, tangents than a maths teacher there, mate. Well done. I know, exactly. <laughs> I know. I don't know if other place say outlets across the world are covering it, but I actually do agree with you in that one. I think it was a penalty for Hibs, but but Lawrence, Not best player of all Scotland. time. Who, who are you telling best me? Best player of all time? Oh, Daniel Fergus, McGree. You're going for Danny? Well, listen, if he gets into Pele's greatest 11, he's certainly worth a shout. Liam, I'm, I'm Team Macy just due to my generation and for growing up and watching him and, and everything else, but mm. um, are you maybe going a bit of time before that? Well, um, no, I never had the pleasure of seeing him play in the flesh, but um, when I was, one of the first football videos I ever got was for my birthday when I was about eight. I got the video of the, the official film of the 86 World Cup. And that was just the Maradona show, you know, and Maradona fascinated me ever since then. And for me, you know, Messi has accomplished more, no question about that. Um, but I think Maradona at his peak is just a just a better player. So it's Maradona for me in terms of outfield players. But being a goalkeeper as I was in my high school days, um, I'm going to say the best player I've seen in the flesh is Oliver Kahn. When he played oh, for Bayern Munich against Celtic yep. back in uh, 2003, I think it was, in the Champions League. Mm. Yep. Yeah. yeah Celebrate the draw. Celtic. Aye. Aye. There you yeah. go. As you can tell, Lawrence is still not let that one go. We all have a can, so he's binned as well. Um, <laughs> but there's a few people coming in here. We've got Danny coming in, obviously. Uh, Pele's worth a mention in, in the debate. And again, another great Celtic connection with Pele that when Brazil played Scotland, it was Stevie Chalmers who walked away. Um, with Pele's jersey, so all the top football players, Messi, Pele, Maradona, who I think everybody mentions in their brief, always have a, a decent wee connection with Celtic, which is always nice, but let's go back to um, the, the main talking point, I think just now, even though we're, we're back in action, uh, is Josip Juranovic, that's our tagline, um, bidding war to begin, but how much will he go to? Um, Liam, we'll come to you on this one first, you know, today it came out, Barcelona have got an interest in them, even though I'd be a wee bit sceptical about actually getting the dosh off them, um, because of financial fair play rules and whatever else. Don't know if that's Spotify uh, probably checks maybe clear yet, but um, it's, I, I, again, I think it's just nice that you, you've got teams of that stature getting linked to a Celtic player, and, and again, you, you're not seeing as much that kind of stepping stone move that, that players used to take from, from Celtic. You know, I think Van Dijk's a, the example of that, that he went to Southampton first before going to Liverpool, that you're now seeing that, that teams around the world, top teams, are quite happy to come in and take a player off our hands. Yeah, exactly. Um, the that that is the big difference is that um, that stepping stone no longer exists. Um, if big clubs want our players, they can come to us directly. The, this this idea of a a player like Van Dyke having to kind of uh, you know do his uh, tour of duty, if you like, with a, a mediocre English team before going to a big English team mm. is uh, is over. Um, I said a couple of weeks ago, actually, before it was certain that Croatia were going to get out of their group, that I thought they would go to at least the last date. And uh, Juranovic, assuming that he played every game, I would say we should accept no less than 20 million. And I did get some ridicule at the time for saying that, but I stand by it. Um, minimum 20 million. And if, it's, if there are teams of the calibre of Barcelona coming in for him, um, we should expect more than that because there is the added inconvenience of losing him mid-season potentially. Mm. Um, but what I would say is that I hope Celtic play it smart and that he goes for a quote-unquote undisclosed, undisclosed fee. Yeah. Because there's nothing worse than we get £25 million for a player and suddenly, that three million pound striker we were looking at is now a nine million pound striker because everybody knows we've got a few quid. Okay, no, absolutely. Um, I think that's probably the base we are working at at this point in time. Um, because I think there was some people who thought Christmas had came early because of a few burst pipes also. So if you keep things in house, <laughs> I think that's always the best way to work things. Um, and Lawrence, I've got Tam coming in here to say Barcelona twenty million, but they need to sell players first. From the the report that came out this morning, um, Xavi does want to strengthen in January, even though no Champions League football that they're into the Europa League. Um, but they'll, they'll need to sell players first, but what a move that would be. And I know that at this point in time, Celtic still want to sit down with Juranovic. They still want to talk for the options with Juranovic. Um, but, but Beach Boys coming in here, I'll just read it out because I don't want to cover up your 
at Celtic Talk. We've got on Lawrence to say this isn't a case of the highest bidder wins the prize. Uh, JJ will know where he wants to go and what clubs. Um, it's what they bid that we will get. Celtic have no say, even if a club offers 10 million more. But I think Lawrence, you know, having sitting him down, the Lassess he offers, um, he probably will have an idea of where he wants to go. But, you know, an opportunity like this, Barcelona, I think would probably be right up his street. Listen, 28 is probably his last big move. He probably is not in huge money at Celtic. Yeah. Uh, or before he came to his, but it probably mm. wasn't huge money. So, yeah, this is his big move and he's got to get it right. Yeah. But that's a lot would be amazing for him. But you know, do they have the money? That's the thing. Yeah. I think before the World Cup, I was saying around about 15. Well, we might, I think he's had a decent World Cup, you know. He's, he's in the team in the tournament. Great game against Brazil. Yeah, I, I would go with Lehman and say, you know, 20 million upwards. But uh, you've, you've got to hope, yeah, you know, it's people that can afford to pay us. You know, there's other teams that talk about big bids for players that you know, never had money. We're all familiar with teams like that, you know. Yep. They almost sign but, Messi or whatever. You know? Yeah, well, that, that's yeah, it. Part, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not as if you see articles like that coming out after a World Cup one, but, um, <laughs> yeah. They, they do have money restrictions, Barcelona. They're under those financial fair play rules, which probably means players would have to go out the door. They are keen on um, strengthening. Liam, the, the one that I find most interesting, I think, is Atletico Madrid, um, because mm. he did send scouts to watch Juranovic against Brazil. He was up against Vinicius and Rodrigo. Obviously, the counterparts in the, the Madrid derby, and he had the two of them in his back pocket. So just from that performance alone, I think any La Liga side um, would probably quite fancy Juranovic. Uh, I was going to say that, you know, maybe, maybe go to 22 or 23 million if it comes with Vinicius in his back pocket, you know. But, <laughs> but, uh, no, um, I think Atletico Madrid might actually be the more realistic move because they'll have the money to do it. But he's still playing in La Liga, he's still playing at the highest level. And to be quite honest, as much as, you know, Barcelona are kind of the... If I had to pick a Spanish team that I like, it's probably Barcelona. But Yeah, I'm the same. Um, but realistically, Atletico Madrid have got a more ch- more chance of doing damage in Europe just now than Barcelona have, given mm-hmm. the current state of play. So if he wants to win things at a European level, Atletico Madrid might actually be the more realistic move for him. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one. Obviously, Barcelona are sitting top of La, La Liga just now. You don't know what kind of Real Madrid team are going to come back after um, this World Cup. But but certainly, you know, Atletico Madrid have an incredible level of consistency. They don't have those money worries that I've spoken about. Um, although Barcelona look as if they might have turned a corner a wee bit, but I think a team like Atletico Madrid would maybe just suit um, Juranovic, which a couple of people are saying in the comments here. Sean's coming in to say Atletico Madrid would suit JJ perfectly and getting to work with Simeone would be brilliant for him. Um, or of course, the, the madman is still there and has been there for a long, long time. Um, but, but Lawrence... This was something I asked you about last week. And I'd asked you about the position of Celtic being in that, that, that Ralston has, you know, a good few games up until we, we go to Ibrox in the Derby. And, and do you potentially bring Juranovic back in? Obviously, the manager confirmed that he would have the week off, meaning he won't be available till after Christmas. But if, if Tony Ralston has a stinker like he did at the weekend, hopefully that was just a, you know, a bit of rustiness and getting back up to speed. Would, would you be tempted to bring him back in for that game at Easter Road now? I don't know about a stinker. I heard the BBC marked him as a three for the game. I don't know. Really. He was not a three. He was a six or seven. He had a few. I, I don't think it was his best game in hoops. I know, T. I, I just I thought it would be benefits best. for a running the team, doesn't he? So yeah, I think yeah, it's just a bit rusty. Uh, I think he was just you know, rusty. He was up against a really quick player. You know that played in it as well. So I, I suppose it's Tony's jersey to lose just now, isn't it? And. Listen, we've got another two right backs behind him just now, so don't, I wouldn't rule anything out with Ange. You know, if he thinks Johnson's better, he'll, put, he'll stick him in. Mm. So I, I don't think it just now that they were going, it's just Ralston or, 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 or Dura just now. I think all three will be in contention. It, you know, it's Tony's jersey to lose, and Ange will be looking at Raymond training performances on the park and saying, right, you're the man. Uh, Liam, what, what was your take on this? Because, you know, I think that's a bit harsh on Tony, BBC giving him a free. I didn't think it was his best performance. It was the one at the end of the game. It was a bit worried about if you remember Johnny Hayes done him. and went a bit of a run. It came to nothing. Um, There's a few other wee ones. I hope it's just a bit of rustiness. Hopefully a lot better performance tomorrow night against Livingston. But do you think there'd be any temptation from from Postacoglu's side to 
to look at the game at Easter Road. Obviously, Ralston by then would have played three games in the space of a week, um, just over a week to, to, to possibly stick in Juranovic at Easter Road or Ibrox. Um Well, I don't think he'll stick it. He'll stick him for, for the Easter Road game because Andrew's true to his word and he told Juranovic is getting a week off, so we won't see him until next weekend at the earliest. Um, that's that's just that's Ange's policy, um, and I don't think he would change that. Um, also, if you remember, le- even leading up to the World Cup, Juranovic was not a guaranteed starter, right? So, it's it's now again, Juranovic is a phenomenal player, no question about that. But it's interesting that we are entertaining bids in the twenty million range for what is essentially a squad player at the moment. You know, because we have two other right backs mm-hmm, yeah. who are perfectly capable of deputising, and there's a debate to be had when they're at the top of their game. Who is the better right back? Because I think Ralston offers you more defensively. Juranovic offers more in an attacking sense, and he's good with dead balls as well. Um, but I think that was the big flaw from Ralston's game at the weekend. He didn't get forward as much as he normally does. But I think, as you say, Aberdeen had quite a pacey attack, and I think that 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 kind of negated any chances that Ralston had to get forward because he had to play a more defensive role. I actually thought he had a decent game, all things considered. Um, I would have given him about a, a seven, um, I, maybe an eight. I, I, I think I, I thought he was all right. six or a seven. Aye. One thing, one thing I want to ask you because it's been something that, that we've chatted about on here before, and I, I know Lawrence is kind of the same boat as me with Dyson Maeda. See, playing him in the right wing, Liam. I hmm. think he's almost wasted out there, just from what, what you get from him. I, I, you know, he looks far more comfortable when you play him on the left-hand side. One of the reasons I thought when I saw the team sheet came out, I thought, right, that's great. Jota and Maeda will interchange throughout the game. That never really happened. I thought we kind of upped our gear a wee bit when Abada came onto the, the, the park. Um, do you think the manager would be tempted at all to, to use Dyson and Light? we seen him at the World Cup because pressing defences high, obviously Aberdeen... Did it make too much a game? It's very hard to say, you know, press a defence then, but just doing that right hand side, I just don't think you get the best of Dyson made out there. No, definitely not. Uh Dyson is a centre forward. Um he can play as a winger when he has to, but all the time that I saw him play over here, first for Matsumoto Yamaga and then later for Yokohama, he was either centre forward with two wingers as Celtic play. Um, that was the way Yamaga set up. But at Yokohama, he was part of a front two. So he was always a striker. Now, he would go wide now and again when the game necessitated it. But then again, so did Kyogo. Kyogo was basically a winger before we signed him and converted him to a striker. Um, and that's the main reason why Kyogo has not really broken into the Japan team the same way Dyson has. Because... Um, Kyogo is deployed for Japan as a winger, whereas Dyson is played in his natural position. I think if you played the two of them the way they, the way they're played at Celtic, I don't think either of them would get into the Japan team because they're not being fully utilised. Um, I wonder if we should consider perhaps switching Kyogo out wide because um, he's got the pace, he can beat a man, he can still cut inside and get into goal-scoring positions when he has to, but I think definitely Maeda is more effective through the middle, no question. Yeah, I, I just think his whole game, even when I've seen him play out widely, you know, just when he's told to press defences, that's when you really see him at his best. Um, always say, you know, we've got creative players like Jotun and Abada who will, will come up with a bit of magic for you. Um, but but Dyson, certainly the way, you know, for a defender, he must be a defender's worst nightmare when he's really going at you because his pace is, is frightening him when he's in your face. Um he really gets something. Lawrence, would you agree with that? Just just playing him out there. You know, I, I thought that the balance of the right-hand side maybe just didn't look too right. And again, maybe that was just why Ralston didn't have that outlet. Um, I, would you I think the manager think, would be tempted at all to, to try Maeda through the middle? I, I don't think that was a fact that it was on the right. Uh, I remember uh, last week I talked about the game at Ibrox where Juranovic was struggling. We had to put Maeda over at the right to help Juranovic out. So I think you can play there. I think it's just Aberdeen was so deep. You know, I think maybe that's what it, what it was for him. First game back after the World Cup, maybe a bit rusty. I like to see him through the middle. Uh, I would agree, like Kyogo, you know, wide. I thought 
And we saw him lead again against uh, the Rangers at Ibrox. I think he'd done all right. He put one in the plate for Edward. It's not his fault, <laughs> you know. The striker misses it from what two or three yards. And, <laughs> and, a, foot was was all, and a foot was already out the door at that point as well for the big man. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'd like to see Kyle go wide. Maybe they're putting through in the middle. Yeah, but for me, I, I think we really need to get another striker in. You know, we've got two two strikers as I'm seeing them, Kyogo and Yakamakis, who are both guaranteed minutes every week. Mm. So how much pressure is really on them to perform? You know, if you get a third striker in there and somebody's thinking, well, I'm missing out this week if I'm not topping the game. The amount of chances we missed in Europe, I think speaks for itself, you know, the, the chance conversion. So, yeah, but unfortunately we don't have the money for Musa, but somebody of kind of that style and quality would be brilliant. Yeah, somebody of that style and quality would be brilliant. Obviously that still adds into the, the conversation around Yakimakis, there's obviously potential there um, that he could possibly leave Celtic in the coming months. Um, but it's an interesting one because obviously, you know, we all watched them perform at the World Cup through the middle. Um, I know a lot of Celtic fans will say he doesn't take his chances. We see Kyogo get a, a great chance at the weekend that he doesn't take either. So it's not just Dyson that has that issue. Um, again, though, I'd rather be saying that I think that's just down to game time having not been at it for a few weeks' time. I think these players just need to get up to speed. Um, and again, you know, Liam playing up against anti-football Jim Goodwin, I don't think really helped it for us, did it? No, no. And um, the funny thing is, though, that, you know, Goodwin rightly got absolutely slated for that approach because he's had a month to basically prepare to take on the champions. And that's the best he can come up with. You know, it's quite... Tactically, it's totally inept because... You know, no disrespect to Aberdeen, but frankly, their defence is not good enough to shut out a team like Celtic for 90 minutes playing that way. You know, they just are not good enough to do that. And they should have realised that. But um, the other thing is, though, ironically, I hope that they do kind of persist with that when they play Rangers, because I think they could <laughs> shut out Rangers playing that way. <laughs> mm. But I think we've got a cutting edge that, that, you know, the other mob don't have. So I think that it's... Uh, it would be interesting if Aberdeen set up that way, but I don't think their fans will allow them to, especially considering they, you know, the hatred between those two clubs is probably as much, if not more so, than the hatred between Celtic and Rangers. So, um, and especially you know, it, season's back, man. You've got a fifty-fifty chance to get a, a penalty against Celtic. Well, that's aye. probably zero if you don't go into Celtic's box. Probably yep. zero, but not impossible in Scotland. Listen, that that's actually yeah, a fair point. I mean, you know, th th that was one of the, the notes of get down here, Lawrence, was, you know, VAR wasn't really too much a talking point in the Celtic game at the weekend. But as you say, with the way things have been going, Celtic have been giving away a hell of a lot of penalties. And if you, you know, if you don't try and make an approach at the Celtic box, you don't really give yourself any chance yet. But, but Lawrence, you know, if you're a paying customer up there, it was dire from their perspective. You know, I've been up there years and years even under Derek McInnes it was never as bad as that they always try to have a go at us um, and you, you would think you would just try and make a game of it I know Goodwin came out after the game with, with some nonsense about trying to open up and they get gubbed 4-1 at Ibrox but you know try and have a go for your fans sake and you know this season I think they've lost one game in the league at home so they had that advantage they've, you know I, I just don't get it I just don't really get them you know empty seats and whatever else but on that, maybe, I just don't get it. Like Martin Dale getting applauds for playing the same every week. You mm. could say, you know, I'm only five minutes away to get applauds for taking points off so been, you know, so yeah, they were ridiculously deep, I thought. Uh, but yeah, it's what you know, if he thinks it's because they opened up against Rangers they beat four one, what would what would we do if they opened up against us to the same level? Mm. So but yeah, I think it was far too cautious you, you, you know there's got to be a, a stage when you came out thought maybe the last 10 minutes they pushed on a, a bit more I thought when he's came on they looked James a bit more James he found yes, you know, some, a lot of joy when he came on and he did a, you know he was looking to create all the time he was moving the ball quicker so yeah it, it was just it was just too deep wasn't it from them and, and too un, unambitious even kind of when we were breaking out before kind of 80 minutes, they really weren't getting enough men up the park for a break. It was maybe just leaving yeah. the two up there and one boy to fall over and hope, hope the ref uh, gives him a free kick, which, you know, he, he did a couple of times. But. Hmm. 
Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, and again, then you know, me, me and Viskies had a decent uh, season for Aberdeen. You thought they would have a go, but they didn't. And again, I, I thought it was funny after the game. Ange got asked about you know r- relief, and uh, I think it was joy. And he said, "Not not relief, because I mean, really, you know, I, I thought Celtic walking away with three points at the weekend was thoroughly deserved. We, we, we deserved to win the game." Um, and as I say, coming back after the World Cup, Cup break, I think you're always going to be a bit rusty. It was three points that mattered. Um, and, and, you know, we're having a few poor efforts from outside the box. I mean, when Callum McGregor lined up the shot at first, I thought, oh no, don't take another shot out of the box or building over the bar. But what a finish. Absolutely tremendous strike. And again, um, because I know Lawrence won't let me get away without saying it, that's James Forrest now. 100 goals, 100 assists for, assists for Celtic joining only Henry Larson and Bobby Lennox, which is an incredible uh, feat for him. Yeah, to just stun him from Jamesy, but you know, I thought come on, he, he was easily one of our better players. I you thought know? he looked like a bright spark were, when he came on, I agree with you, him and Leah Labada, I thought were, yeah. They moved the ball quicker, didn't they? I, th- I thought at times we were a wee bit pedestrian, a bit too many touches, but Jamesy was like moving it across. It. Crosses weren't always the best, but he was getting in quick before Aberdeen were, were, were getting too set, so yeah, great to see him reach another milestone in his career. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Liam, would you agree with that? I, I thought a bad, a probably more than Forrest, really looked a real big bright spark, but that, that wee spell that Forrest came on, he didn't get a lot of time in the park. Gives the assist for the goal, and he was unlucky, went that, down that run, if you remember, down the left-hand side, and really unlucky. Um, but, yeah, I, I thought both wingers coming off the bench with a decent impact in the game. Absolutely. I think a bad, especially, because... Um, you know, we, we, we talked about Maeda's qualities, but that was not his kind of game at the weekend, playing against a team that sit that deep. Abada has more capability to kind of make things happen. Maeda will run all day, but I think Abada has an edge in terms of skill and the ability to take on and beat a man. And that was more what we needed. And it was clear from the moment the second half started, Abada was seeing so much more action down that wing. Um, and to me, you know, I was watching the game with my dad, and my dad was kind of like, "Oh no, this this is going to be nothing each. It's going to be crap, and it's going to give it's going to give the other mob false hope going into the game at New Year." And I was like, "No, no, 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 no. Goal's coming. The goal is coming. I can feel yeah. it." And it did, because as I said, I just knew throughout that with the, the the level of possession that we had, the way we were totally in control of the game, Aberdeen could not get out their own half, let alone get to our penalty area for most of the game. Um, to me, the win was inevitable. And I, you know, yeah, a bit relieved when the goal went in, but not particularly surprised by it. No, I, I wasn't surprised at all. I, you know, that old saying, you could feel it in my water, and I say, that my pal standing beside me? And it did eventually come, rightly corrected there, Jimmy Johnson and Henrik Larson. Um, mm. you, you would actually think with the amount of goals that Bobby Leonard scored at Celtic that he would be in that category, but he's not. Um, we Bobby, 273 goals um, in the hoops. But th- there you go, and I think that you know speaks volumes. So, rightly corrected there, Jimmy Johnson, Henrik Larson, James Forrest, 100 goals, 100 assists for Celtic. I think probably some of the other guys um, from back in the day, if assists were recorded back then, McGrory, um, we would possibly be making it and um, my friend Matthew's a relation of Peter Scarf who was Jimmy McGrory's striking partner and you can only imagine how many assists that man got um, for the amount of goals that McGrory scored at Celtic so um, I think there'd probably be a wee bit more on the list but that's the the, the data we've got and, and there, that's it so yeah but um, off the back of that Lawrence I think Abada for me definitely starts tomorrow night against Livingston yeah, yeah. Great show when he came on, as, as Liam said. He, he, he was beating guys, he was getting crosses in, he was getting shots off. We're going to face more of the same against Livingston, aren't we? Yep. So, Even though yeah, he's saying, he, he said yesterday that's not going to happen, but you know what is going to happen, don't you? What, what else is he going to do? <laughs> you, you know, I think Livingston aren't, aren't as talented, talented a team as Aberdeen. No. You know, I don't think he's got too many options. If he opens up, I think he'll Livingston will get destroyed. Uh, you know, he sets his team up for seems like forever just to play in football, pack it deep, play for set pieces. But, you know, it, it, I suppose it's kept him in the Premiership. So, you know, it's worked for Livingston. That's probably the height of their ambitions. But yeah, a bad day to start. But you, you know, maybe you know, on the flip side, a bad and Forest come on against a tired defence. 
you know, because they were doing a lot of changing. You know, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I suppose that's part, part of Ange's ball, isn't it? You know, it's make the opposition work. Don't give them a break. So it's when we, we, we do bring on fresh legs, you know, it's, it's harder for the opposition. And, you know, the five sub rule really helps us. So, you know, in that respect. But, yeah, Absolutely. I'd start Absolutely, it does really help us. Um, and again, it's just giving defenders those other uh, issues um, to handle. And I thought it worked to a seat. Um, and again, you know, Jota, you know, been a top top player for Celtic this season, arguably one of the best players uh, for Celtic this season. But again, he didn't have his best of games. So listen, I think it's just probably doing a bit of rustiness. I think you'll see a different um, animal tomorrow night. But but Liam, you, you spoke about domination there in the game, and it was that. And I think the stat that really summed that up for me was that Callum McGregor had completed um, 23 more passes in the whole Aberdeen team which is ridiculous <laughs> 140 yeah, to 117 uh, I saw a, quite a funny one for anybody who's a fan of the uh, the comic books and the, the Marvel superhero films someone had made the meme of like of uh, Thanos reaching for his gauntlet saying fine I'll do it myself but it was Callum McGregor's face right, okay. you know? did they have, did have the mask on in the picture <laughs> Did they keep keep the mask on? Uh, no, he, pro- he probably should have, but uh, I heard they loaned that to one of one of the Croatian centre halves for the tournament. Didn't know. Aye, yeah, <laughs> uh, he must have gave it a spray paint as well. Um, but Lawrence, you, you were a wee bit sceptical about maybe bringing Aye. McGregor in at the weekend. You know, I'd said yeah. last week that I think I thought, you know, if he was fit, he was going to get thrown in there. But I thought he just saw his his impact and his authority that he stamps all over that team when he's yeah. in there. And uh, again, to kind of just put it into the wider conversation it's almost as if it's like a mental muscle thing with our team that they're, they're just like you know a team possessed it by the time it hits that 85 minute point or whatever if we're needing a goal it's just as if they, they know what to do which is an incredible thing it must be very very hard to drill that in and teach players but that team has definitely got it and you've seen it countless times this season now but I think you know there's no argument what a quality goal but First half, the team in general, Callum included, I don't think we're moving the ball quick enough. We've got it back. We're taking two or three touches to move it on. Players that started moving it quicker, but, you know, what I've had in Forest when they come on, they really start to get an impact. And I think a lot of that was to do with the speed we're moving it. But, you know, so I, I thought Callum looked a bit rusty first half, but, you know, how do you get rid of the rust without playing games, I suppose? You know, That's it. you need to tighten apart, don't you, to go up to speed? But, yeah, what a strike, you know, we never stop. And that's it, isn't it? You know, I think there's been a, a quote that Billy Conley said, you know, they just never know where they beat. When they beat this club, they just keep going. And he said, there's something magical about that. And it just runs right through Celtic's history, doesn't it? I mean, you mind the centenary of just all the late winners there. And it was just, yeah. Yeah, another one. And you, you've probably seen it all over Twitter. Fans of other clubs saying, oh, they've done it again, you know. <laughs> that's what champions do. Yep, that's what champions do. Liam? I quite like the one that I saw talking about other fans. I don't know if you saw the, the tweet somebody put out that basically uh, Cal Max goal gave this guy an existential crisis. <laughs> oh, well. I'll, 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 read, I'll, read, I'll read exactly what he said, right? Um, now, his name, his, his Twitter name includes the words True Blue WATP, so no prizes for guessing what team he supports, right? But it says here... I would... I probably... <laughs> There must be a reason why this is all happening. I believe in God, and there's no way he'd do this for no justified reason. <laughs> Maybe he's trying to show me something beyond football. Maybe it's time that the world we live in, if we accept the world we live in is rubbish, and I should only focus on myself. Or he'll start supporting <laughs> cricket or rugby. So you never oh, know. Maybe I'll oh, oh. switch to a different sport. I'm sure, uh, Liam, that that's not the first time that, that Callum McGregor's probably gave that a particular gentleman an existential crisis. So best of luck to him with that for the for the coming seasons. Um, yeah. Just to move on, because I thought this one came out this morning and it's a, a report has came out that, that Brentford Lawrence are, are tracking Boson Label. And this ties into the chat we had last week again about Scott Robertson. Um, but but Labo, like Rocco Vata, has looked a lot closer to the first team that, that, than Robertson really has. 19 years old, joined last season, played a good bit in the Lowland League, went over to Sydney um, on the bench at the weekend because Stephen Welsh is out at this point in time. But but surely, you know, a, a player like that, you probably want to keep him at the club. But again, you know, Ange spoke about with Scott Robertson 
about timing and everything else. And at this point in time, you're, you're definitely seeing that there's three defenders in Cam, Carl Starfield and Moritz Shanks that are probably ahead of in the pecking order. Uh, Yuki Kobayashi's now came in and we know that Welsh is out. So, so where does it you know, fit for for Boston Labo? How do you say to him, you know, this is going to be your path into this first team? Listen, last week we were touching on Welsh and going, you know, it's probably time for him to move for his career, whether that's on loan where you bring him back or, or, or selling him. I suppose that takes one out of the picture for Boston Labo. But, you, I, I, you know, he's a bit younger than Welsh. You wouldn't want to let him go without testing him. In the first team, you, you, you need to see what you've got. You, you, you know, you, as long as the player's happy to stay, right, you, cause I suppose there's a caveat with the uh, Josh Doig stuff. You know, it was the player that, that wanted to move. So, if he's happy to, to stay and can see a path, part of that might be going. Well, look, Welsh has had games, but we've sold them, we've moved them on, so we do look after your career. We're not going to let you rot here. You will get your chance. You'll get some game time. You know, and if you're good enough, you'll be in. But yeah, I, I suppose there's a bit of luck in everything, you, you know, and he's got some cracking players in front of him just now. I can't see Sam staff out at Carter Vickers, you know. I can't yep. see he's been a rush to sell them. So behind them, you, you, you know, you've got Jens, who I think will probably keep. You've got Kobayashi, and I, I think Welsh will move, but just don't know that. There's four decent players in front of you. you you're going to have to do a lot to break in. But yeah, you, we've got to give them some game time to, to see what we've got before they let them go. You know, well, unless Brentford want to give us five or six million, you, you, you know. But I, I, I doubt that's kind of the money they're talking about. So, yeah, they, don't let him go without seeing him in the first team. Yeah. As you say, he's, he travelled to Australia, he was on friendly. So, it, he's getting close, but uh, it, it's going to be minutes on the part of matter to both him and us. Him to see Absolutely. You know, his career development, us to see, oh, has he got it at this level? Let, let us know your thoughts about that and the, the comments, folks. I know I've got one in here um, coming from Beach Boys saying that Labo isn't that much younger than players and just signing his position. He's um, probably had enough in tools as agent to get my club bits, but Beach Boys thinks in the comments. Liam, what, what was your take on this? Mm-hmm. Because it's it is an interesting one, I think. It's interesting you know, how close Labo's been to the first team. He's been training with them for a good wee bit now. Um, Lawrence you know, talks there about getting game time in the park. Is it then, you know, sitting them down, trying to get a loan deal, seeing how he gets on and then bringing him back and then trying to maybe bring him into the team? Would, would that be the, the best route? Because today it's been reported that, that Brentford, Verona, uh, Hellas Verona, that is, and Pisa are the, the teams that are interested in the big man. Mm. Yeah, I think ideally get him out on loan for a year, let him go and play football and learn his craft. Um, the raw talent is there, but... Um, I think it needs a needs refinement, and he's not going to get that with the greatest of respect. He's not going to get that playing in the the West of Scotland League um, for the B team. So he needs to. This is why we need a proper reserve league. You know, this is exactly why we need to have a proper reserve league. Um, because back in the day, guys like this could play week in week out for the reserves, which was a decent standard playing against the, the second string of other teams mm-hmm. in the, at our level. And then if you did well, you would graduate into the first team. But the gap between the level the B team are expected to play at now and the first team is just astronomical. And that is why I think, and it's not Ange's fault, but that's why Ange has resorted to making signings like Kobayashi as opposed to bringing in untested raw talents like Lawal because he's seen what Kobayashi does in the J-League. He knows the guy's the real deal and uh, he's confident that he can make that transition to Celtic. Seeing a guy play against Whitehill Welfare or whatever, you're not going to be so sure that he can he can cut it against Rangers or Hearts or whatever, you know? Yeah, and you know, I found it really interesting. Jackie McNamara was in the press yesterday talking about Dokes um, moved to Liverpool here and um, you know he, he said that he, he thought the derby game would have swung it for Doak but then he goes on to say um, because my whole thing was show the kid that you're going to keep him show him that he's not behind six or seven other players he doesn't want to play against civil service strollers in the B team um, but for the, the derby game he was getting bombarded with tickets for this for that down where he lived in Ayrshire he turned his phone off you forget he was only 16 I asked what he was thinking and he just didn't want to say when Ben went down to visit Liverpool, Klopp said, uh, Ah, Ben, I've seen your stuff straight away. He was made to feel really welcome. 
and basically Jackie McNamara said after that he made up his mind that he was already out the door. Um, and Lord, you don't want to see you know that being a continual route for players. But again, you know, you know, as Liam says there, in terms of opposition and whatever else, I think for for Lavel's development, you want to see him probably go out and loan if we're going to keep a hold of him. But but Kobe Ash is interesting in the sense that um. I was talking to Dan Lo- Dan Orlovitz about this, Liam, and he was mm. talking about Kobayashi probably, possibly making that breakthrough very soon at the Japan national team, just due to the defensive situation and centre backs. Whereas Labo, you know, he's been called up for, for Ireland here, Lawrence as well. So he's probably a player that you'd really like to see go out, get a good, you know, amount of game time under him against decent opposition, whether that's in, you know, Scottish football or English football, and, and then see where you're at after him. But again, you're looking at it, he's only contracted until next year. So if you're going to do that, you're going to need to get something moving quickly. Yeah, if it's contracted to next year, you're kind of back, back end of the season. I think what, what I have got, you know, Christie, two players Sorry, have worked, one load that, the that's, season. That's 2024. I'm already in 2023 mode, so 2024 that is. Yeah, it's... Months. Listen, if we can get something lined up for him, I, I, I think it would be great. You know, get him on loan and do an iron and do a Christie with it, but... Keeping a player happy as well, isn't it? And, and some types, you know, maybe the money would be too much. I think you mean, as I said, you know, Brentford come in and offer five million or four million, you'd be bite your hand off. So, it's, so you, it's, there's a bit of a balance in that to be, be had. There's another other moving parts. What we're we going to do with Welsh? Are we going to sell him? We're we going to put him in loan. You, you know, because if I think Welsh stays, he's ahead of him again. The, the gents stay. So, and who, who knows what what you know? Tosh finds out there when he's, he's out scouting. Find another brilliant centre half and say, Right, I'm going to look, and this is what you need to sign. So, yeah, it'd be good, you know, if, if the full squad could just be boys were, were brought through from the, well, not the reserves, but through the ranks at Celtic Park. Ideal, but you know, in reality, it's probably not going to happen, is it? So, it's getting to decision time with him. A lot of it will be how much money is on the table. You know, Absolutely. You know, if it's, yep. say, two million. What could Dan do with two million? But that's it, you know. I use Kobayashi as a, a good example there. And, you know, Liam, you were nodding your head there when I spoke about you know, that breakthrough into the Japan team. When you're signing players like that, that you say, and already knows the profile, he already knows the fit. A- Abada is probably another example of that when you were comparing him and Doak. Obviously, Doak was a lot younger, um, two, three years younger than him. But it's the same that we are going out of bringing in younger talent. And what kind of message that sends, I don't know. But, you know, you're probably better as a signing a better quality of player and um, which you know points to your your academy system not not working to the best of your advantage just just in Lavo here Mark's coming in to say Lavo looked a long way from the first team and um, when he last saw him and um, so that's that Gary also saying here here a need for a reserve league not only to bring young players through but to get long-term injuries up to speed okay. I thought Brentford was an interesting fit. We know Ayers obviously went down there directly from Celtic, um, and they've got that link to FC Midland. We've seen what they've did in recent years, owned by the same owners. And Brentford, the way they sign players, um, I won't mention you know a striker that went to Brentford rather than, than Celtic either. But the, the way that they sign players, a lot of that is driven by data and metrics and everything else. And it's interesting that they're having a look at it, both and Label, and obviously the two Italian clubs are. You know, thinking of as Lauren mentioned, your Josh Joy, Josh Doig, Lewis Ferguson, um, Liam Henderson, et al. Aaron Hickey's another one who, who's went over there and made an impact. Um, so I think that's quite interesting. Even the the, the profile of clubs that are looking at Labo here. It's interesting with the Italian clubs in particular because over the last sort of eighteen months to two years, there has been this kind of emerging pattern where. You know, we Celtic tend to, tend to look on the J League as like this potential feeder for talent we can develop. It looks to me as if the Italian leagues are now looking at Scotland and thinking of that as a as yeah. a, a cheap uh, a cheaper development pool option. But they're not; they don't have the same uh, how can I say disrespect that uh, a lot of uh, smaller English clubs have. So, if Lalau goes there, I think we're more likely to get a seven-figure offer for him. Whereas if he goes to England, it might be like, I will take him on loan for three months or something and see how it goes. You know, whereas I think the Italian clubs are more likely to come up with the readies. So if we want to loan him, I think Brentford's a good option. If we want to sell him, either of the Italian clubs would be the better 
option for him and for Celtic in that situation. Yep, some more comments coming in here. Um, you see, the Italian teams clearly see we have young, talented players who are massively undervalued. Yeah, that's a great exactly. point that you make earlier um, about you know, the way Celtic work, the G-League market, the way that Italian clubs are now working the SPFL Premiership. We know our game can be undersold a bit. We know games like the way Aberdeen played on Saturday doesn't really help th the matter. But, um, yeah, it's, it's much the same situation. And Ryan's came in here to say that he believes Labo should be getting a loan move somewhere up here come January for some game time to help his development. Not a permanent move away without having seen him properly. Um, it's an interesting one. It's it's one that's, you know, kind of came out of nowhere with Labo today, but um, one to, to, to keep our eyes on. Um, Liam, I should have properly introduced you earlier on. I, I didn't. <laughs> um, you do want to see more of Liam's coupon, as he'd probably say. Um, he is <laughs> a regular on the Celtic Down Under podcast, which uh, I think is probably booming ever since I arrived at the club. It was already um, quite well favoured, but I'm sure that that, that that's helped um, at this point in time. And your, your man, Tom Rodgick, even starting to come on to a game down at West Brom. Aye, it's uh, the whole thing with Celtic Down Under has been brilliant actually, because I've been I've been working with, with Jared and the boys for a couple of years now. But um, you know, I I joined them uh, the uh, the season before Ange came in, and then the following summer Ange comes in. And then myself being based in Japan, our first signing was a Japanese player. So it was it was the perfect storm for our for our wee podcast to uh, to broaden our horizons a bit, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, it's great. I really I, I enjoy I enjoy talking about Celtic on here. I enjoy talking about Celtic on Celtic Down Under. It's um, different styles of podcast. Um, Celtic Down Under's a wee bit maybe a wee bit more laid back, uh, you know. I get to throw a few more of my dad jokes there without worrying about getting the sack, you know. But uh, yeah, it's a aye, it, it, it's a good balance that we have. And um, I think if you're a Celtic fan looking to get the perspective of people outside of Scotland, then that is Celtic down under is, is is something you should definitely look to because you know Jared is Australian born and bred but you'll you'll not meet a bigger Celtic man than him he's very very passionate about the club about the players and he's also a great him and Shane are both great advocates of the the A league um much the same way I advocate for the J league and I really think it's a great um it's a growing it's a growing market Australia as well I think there's still a couple of years behind uh uh, behind Japan in terms of the, the league development, but uh, you know they're coming on fast. And uh, I was also interested to see that Celtic were in for a Korean striker during the World Cup. I don't mm. know if that's going to come off, but Chogu Sung. Yes, the K League is another league that is emerging very quickly, but it hasn't really been tapped up in Europe yet. So we could make a killing if we got in there to the same extent we've got into the Japanese league. Mm. There's a, there's a lot of nice positivity coming in here. Liam Fordy, um, Paul Collin, your Japanese football expert. We, we enjoy your insight into the G League. And obviously, <laughs> Aussie football. Um, Paddy's got you doing as a, an Aka song. I know that was Kyogos when he first came in, mm. but um, you, you're now getting it. So um, just to kind of fire this one over while we're on that subject, uh, Lanky's coming to say he doesn't think we'll, we'll sign any more players from Japan this season. Kobayashi, for me, Liam, came as a bit of a surprise when, when it was... It, it came out, but then you start putting the bits of the jigsaw puzzle together and you go, yeah, good signing. Um, obviously, you, you see right away he's got that bond with Kyogo that they're cutting about Christmas markets here and whatever else. <laughs> um, and again, you know, playing that team like VCL Cobes with, with guys like uh, Iniesta, etc. Um, you know, yeah. he, he fits a decent profile at a player. And when you look at his stats and whatever else, he's comfortable with the ball at his feet. He likes to come out for the back, blah, blah, blah. I'll um, make a wee prediction on Kobayashi now, actually. Um, if you remember about a year ago, we were in for Koi Takura, who yes, right. ended up going Schalke. to Germany instead. Yeah, now it's Schalke. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, no, didn't he go somewhere else after Schalke? He still played in Germany anyway, right? He played but at the he, World Cup, didn't he? He did, Takura. yeah. 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 Um, missed out on the Croatia game due to suspension, unfortunately. Right. But, um, but he is a couple of years older than Kobayashi, but still a young centre-back. And with the likes of Yoshida retiring now, um, the gap is there for someone to go in and partner Itakura. And it's kind of ironic that 
the guy we tried to get and the guy we've now got in Kobayashi could end up being Japan's centre back pairing at the next World Cup. Because I think within within the next twelve months that will be the established order that Itakura and Kobayashi will become Japan's preferred centre back pairing. There you go. You heard it here first, and as you say, with Yoshida heading out, there's no reason why not to. Um, which again asks a lot of questions about where the breakthrough will come for, for Kobe Ashi, what's already in front of him at Celtic, but we, we will see. Um, Laura, just to bring him back into the mix, we never even mentioned him um, earlier on when we were talking about Labo. Ross has come in here to say, Loan him to Aberdeen, who can pair him with scales, future Celtic back line. Again, that was something that Jim Goodwin was talking about today. I think Aberdeen are a wee bit sceptical about keeping the holder skills because Celtic do have a recall option um, in January, but I can't see that happening, can you? No, I, I, I just don't think skills is at a level. But, you know, we're not, not really seeing what's sent half but I, I, I don't think he's at a level for Celtic. What I've seen him, you know, he's got a decent cross on him, decent shot, but I, I just think Aberdeen's probably his level. I think Aberdeen are trying to get the money down, aren't they? They're saying, oh, we can't mm-hmm. afford them. Yep. I, I think that's part of it. I think, you know, I just had a minute to look at it and decided not. Uh, he's not for him. Uh, I'd expect to see more transfer activity, probably. You know, you know, Andrew's got philosophy. If, he, if his teams don't stop in the park, I think he'll be doing that with his scouting network. So I'd expect to see more to come in. But scales coming back, not playing the first team. No, that's it. And you want players to develop um, 19 appearances he's made for Aberdeen this season. You want that to continue. 13 in the League 6 in the League Cup, so I think you'd uh, you'd rather keep that. Roberts came in here, Liam to see, Takur is a great prospect, hope Kobayashi can reach the same level. Um, and a wee bit of uh, tongue-in-cheek here. What about skills? It took Aberdeen seven defenders to replace him in the back four on Saturday. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, that's right, we like that. That's, that's good, I like that. Um, I think I, I wanted to bring this in because we do like a bit of music chat on here. I know for anybody that listens in on a Thursday week with Paul John, and JP, I like a bit of music chat here. Uh, and the, the sad news came last night that, that Terry Hall, the lead singer of the specials, had passed away. I know people will go right away. What does that relate to Celtic? Um, but I think his values and the way he approached life and, and standing up for justice um, was something that I think is a lot of Celtic people with a Celtic state of mind um, shared. Um, and I know for you guys who may have been specials fans growing up, tunes like Ghost Town and whatever else um, were probably anthems to your childhood. So... Um, I, I'm sure, I know there was people saying in the, the comments here, it was very sad news to lose him at the age of um, 63. And the, the last time I actually saw the specials, I was talking to Brian McClare um, before the gig and uh, the Sarahid, um, and he was going over to, to see the gig, not knowing that that would be the specials, last gig with Terry in Glasgow in the Barrowlands, but that was last September. So I think um, as the specials did sing, enjoy yourself, it's later than you think. And I think that's a message that should ring through um, everyone's life and something that he try to um, always shine through gentlemen tomorrow night we're back in action um, it's been crazy because I've had so many weeks off and now we're, we're back in here we've been talking about Aberdeen there for a good wee while we've got Livingston tomorrow night Lawrence would you expect too many changes or stick with the same kind of team a bad one for the start I think maybe Yakimakis on for the start yeah Moy in for O'Reilly maybe but yeah so changing three, I suppose that's a decent amount of changes. Liam, a few changes. I asked, I asked the boss in uh, Friday in the, the pre-match presser about rotation. He says, yep, that's not going to be something that goes away, you know, just because we had that big amount of games, we've got to take the squad, we've got to keep doing that. And, you know, it's all about competition and whatever else. And I imagine for a game like this at Celtic Park, he, he might make a, a, a few wee changes, maybe even see Burnaby coming into the team or something like that. I would like to see us start with a front three of Jota on one side, Abada on the other, and Maeda through the middle. Um, that would be the closest thing to the way Japan play, to incorporate Maeda. And it's not, I don't think those three have actually played on the pitch at the same time yet this season, um, the way it's worked out. Um, they've certainly not started a game with that front front three. And I would like to see Celtic try it because I think you would see a different type of, you will see the type of Maeda that I have I've seen for years in Japan already. You know, the, the guy that I've been telling everybody, he's a great player, just play him properly, you know. Um, but also, I think, um, 
I think, yeah, Burnaby is a good shout to possibly get a start. Um, yeah, I, apart from that, I hope Ralston continues to play and I hope that Ange just ignores the, the negativity in the media because Tony Ralston is one of our most dependable servants and he deserves better than to be cut loose because he has one mediocre, I won't even say bad game, mediocre game against Aberdeen. Um, so, yeah, I hope uh, I hope... I hope Tony's still there. And, uh, yeah, apart from that, I don't really see much change. The midfield looked good at the weekend. Yeah, much, um, more, much more balanced, I think, for me, that midfield. Yeah. I think that's another question, though, as well, is that, you know, from what I've been hearing in Japan as well as in Scotland, Idiguchi is on the way out directly, yeah. um, which is a real shame because can't fault his effort, but it's just not happened for him. Um, mm. And... Uh, Avogard, I think, there's question marks there as well. So could we look to bring in more midfielders, perhaps, I wonder? Because Gucci's heading out. McCarthy, I think we all agree that's a signing that probably shouldn't have happened in the first place. And Avogard has not really done it since he's come in. He is only a loan deal, so he could be mm-hmm. sent back to his parent club. Yep, and, and Robertson's in the way out too, so there's another midfielder out the door. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's yeah. an interesting point. And whether, you know, January team would look at potentially um strength from the midfield that I mentioned Lydony last week, um, who Lawrence remembers from, from two thousand and three, of course, um, and that game in the last game of the season. So it will be interesting to see if we're, we're looking at a centre midfielder. I know one of the other targets that we had what was a striker and that's kinda of went a wee bit cold just now. You mentioned uh, the, the Korean striker um, who, we, who we're looking at so there's two positions we, we might look at I, I, again we gave Terry Hall his bit also um, Primal Schemes Martin Duffy passed away um, Primal Scheme is a band a, a good friend of um, the Axon podcast um, so base wishes um, to them and the loss of their, their, their band mate um, so yeah two two great men from two great bands that I, I think you know have a Celtic connection and a and I'll be certainly primal screen do so. Um, thoughts go out to, to them. Um, gentlemen, thank you for joining me on this Tuesday afternoon. It's been a pleasure. It's went by fast. You heard it at the start. If you haven't already downloaded, played it on loop. The glory and the dream is there on all good streaming platforms to buy or to stream. You can get it for free. Don't worry. We don't need to charge you all the time. It is there. If you haven't done so, please do download it. Spread the word. Spread the good news. Go in peace. Thank you for watching A Celtic State.